My name is Ewan Croft, and I'm the Technical Art Director here at Hangar 13. That's just a traditional Voronoi. Really simple Voronoi fracture setup on a piece of roof geometry. And what Houdini allows us to do is to create a fairly interesting fracture pattern. So you can see that we have variable frequency in terms of our fracturing. And then just with a fairly simple setup, I can actually give it a lot more visual interest. You can see now the edges are broken up and it's a much more organic shape. And the benefit of that is that if I need to change the fracture geometry that we're breaking up, I can just simply reload my source geo and it will automatically update it and we'll get this very nice organic uh, fracture pattern. Now in the old days, if I had to do that, I would manually craft that either with volume fracturing or with cutters or something like that. And if I had to change the source geometry for whatever reason, I'd have to redo all that work manually to a large degree. So this is a huge time saver to be able to simply reload the fracture geometry and have it uh, run through this process and end up with a very crafted appearance with the benefit of doing it as efficiently as a simple Voronoi. So one thing we were trying to do is I wanted to demonstrate to the tools team the benefits of procedural content. So a quick um, you know, uh, example was a fence tool. So basically what we have here is a very simple piece of terrain and a spline. So the idea is that a designer or an artist can create a fence by simply drawing a spline on the terrain. So I can use this fence tool and I can input my terrain and then I can input my curve and, although it's a little bit hard to see, it gives me a fence. Now that fence isn't very interesting at this point, um, although I can go ahead and uh, I can change the spline and uh, adjust the shape of it and all that. And you can see that it'll adjust the fence. But again, it's not a very interesting looking fence. So we can now go in and we can adjust some parameters. We can say uh, how far the, the fence posts are apart. We can say I want two wires instead or three or four or whatever. Um, I can then add some, again, it doesn't look very interesting. It looks very procedural. Not a lot of, you know, sort of the, the randomness you get in the real world. So we can add some sag on the wires and then we can add some noise on the wires like the barbed wire has kind of gotten contorted when they were unwinding it maybe that's a little bit much um, we can adjust the distance of the barbs we can adjust the height a little bit if we want to um, we can give it square posts or round posts if i can get there there we go now we've got a different kind of post um, and we also have wind, so it can take into account our global wind parameters. Um, and then again, though, I mean, so now it's starting to look a little bit better. It looks a little bit more natural, but still, they're perfectly aligned and all that. So now I can just add that sort of real world, that natural human element a little bit. And now you can see, it looks like the posts have kind of drooped in different directions. And the cool thing about it is, let's say the artist wants to change the terrain. It doesn't matter. It'll just adhere hmm. to the terrain. This is something that, you know, is probably on par with the complexity of our power line tool. But this was literally generated by a technical artist, you know, starting on a Monday at about 11 a.m., goofing around for the day, maybe two more hours on a Tuesday. And was, you know, it was really the digital asset that made the case for engineering to take on uh, implementing Houdini Engine into our proprietary game tools. Um, so we wanted to be able to assign a piece of terrain uh, to a digital asset or vice versa, or input a digital asset. So what you see here is a piece of terrain that is has been modified to add a road, including the design components, as well as kind of a you know a temp forest. This is obviously prototype assets, but the idea is we can instantiate on our terrain any asset out of our asset browser, and so it doesn't require any memory, you know, any additional or nominal additional memory and all that. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to speed things up a bit by switching this to, we're going to just prototype with cues because it takes a little while to draw all these trees and grass and everything. But now that we have this, you can see that if I end up, if I want to move this road and I just put on a slider, the ecosystem will respond to how I've placed, um, you know, a design element such as a road. And that means that artists don't have to go back and paint 
um, all of this uh, foliage and whatnot. And the other thing is we can continue to iterate on it. So the vision right now is, okay, we have trees, we have bushes, and we have grass. But I can then, let's take it to the next level. I've got a bunch of flowers. I want to add a particle system. I want some bees and some butterflies. And that comes with the audio of the particle system. So now let's say that I want to take that further. Or I, all of a sudden, I don't like this particular tree. I continue to add and update that ecosystem rule set, that digital asset, if you will. And that means that we can start to define open worlds in a much more systemic way. So it gives us the ability to um, create much more interesting um, spaces in which to, to allow the player to explore and play. Um, so another thing I'll show is we'll go into smooth shaded, or uh, excuse me, smooth wire. And I want to show this, this road again. Notice the topology here. Now, if I shift that road over, I'm just moving it. What we're doing here is we're taking our road spline here and we're reading the terrain and applying the topology of the terrain to our road tool. And you can see how it follows the terrain. But what that results in is a weird road that follows the terrain perfectly. So then we are then applying rule sets that apply to roads. We want the road to be relatively flat. We want there to be a certain amount of buffer on the sides. So we're then taking the rules of the road and feeding that back to the terrain. Hmm. So you get, you can draw a loose road network. It will then adhere to the terrain. We'll then apply the rules of the road to our road, and then we'll feed that back to the terrain. And you can see that as I shift this over, it will look like bulldozers came through and cut this road out of the side of the terrain and even gave it a bit of a bank on the side. And so that gives designers the opportunity to generate road networks and modify them on the fly without requiring artists to go back and have to re-sculpt the terrain to match the road. And that is, you can measure the savings of that time and energy in weeks and months rather than in hours. This is a, you know, these are really, really substantial uh, time savings and orders of magnitude of efficiency improvement. You can see that the ecosystem follows the, uh, the design elements like the road. Um, and again, you know, we're, this is all procedural. So wherever I put water, I'm going to get sort of watery moss, you know, sort of water foliage. And then in all of the trees and the ecosystem is placed based on elevation, kind of like it is in the real world and based on slope angle. So you don't get trees growing up the side of cliffs and things. Again, I mean, um, the idea is that you want to get an 80% starting point for free, which means that artists can spend their time crafting where they want to craft and not having to spend so much time just getting their first pass and then having a little bit of time left over to do their crafting. So what it allows us to do is really do the great work of crafting high fidelity worlds rather than simply populating them and then crafting them with the time we have left over. Um, so again, I'll just kind of side that and you can just sort of see how that road network is. Um, cutting into the side of the hill. And it even can handle fairly uh, extreme slopes before it starts to fall apart. And I, I've uh, file cached my snow because I'm building with VDBs and it's kind of slow. But if I turn that off, my curve here, you can see that I can cut that even into pretty extreme hillsides here. And it will actually look almost passable. And from a design perspective, the smoothness of that curve is based on what is viable for the driving. So for the driving simulation. So we can adjust how smooth that road is like, well, these curves are a little crazy. You guys have to smooth out that curve. I can simply adjust that parameter and it will update the roads. It'll update the terrain, move my ecology around and my ecosystem around. And um, so these represent pretty significant leaps forward in terms of procedural content and especially building large open worlds.